Grazie. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, VTEC, and thank you, everybody. Uh, it's great to be giving a talk. Actually, I was thinking this morning that uh, I do give uh, quite a few talks uh, here and there. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, a concentration of hydrologists and water resources people has never been the case. You know, it's been to climate communities or uh, some cases to the uh, international political entities, which never goes anywhere anyhow. Uh, but uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm honored. Uh, I should say that uh, the title I've selected, if I can figure this one out, uh, which I will, uh, is uh, based on, I think, uh, the concept that was established for the Quashi uh, uh, this year. Can you hear me? or? Uh, Maybe I have to check to see if it's on. Uh, hmm? That's it. You see, it's all in a matter of switches on and off. It's still not very loud. Okay. Go ahead. Is that uh, okay now? You can drop this in I will pocket. do that. I will do that. Anyhow, um, so I will try to pretty much uh, walk through a little bit of a history uh, that I have had the pleasure of being engaged in in terms of the hydrologic sciences. In the way of background, by the way, I am a mechanical engineer. I mean, that's I wanted to be an astronaut, aerospace, but some turns of events uh, made it that I went to UCLA for graduate school and uh, uh, switched to operations research and engineering systems, and then ended up working on hydrologic modeling with John Dracup, which I've been grateful to ever since one of the greatest mentors and most humble people in the world. And uh, so therefore, if there are parts that are related to my own work and those of my students that I don't present correctly, I blame it on my pre other degrees, such as mechanical engineering or uh, operations research. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the blame, uh, put, the, put it on that, not in the hydrologic side of things. I am grateful to the, uh, of course, support of the various agencies over the years and the work that we've done recently with UNESCO. And uh, of course, Pete Eagleson was mentioned. Pete Eagleson has been really a good friend, a mentor, and uh, truly a role model for all of us, including myself. Uh, this is back in the, uh, I guess, uh, early, late 80s when we had just gone to Tucson. And it was one event in our house uh, that Pete was there with uh, Dave Woolheiser, some of the people that you might recognize in that picture. And then I had the pleasure of having him as a member of our advisory board for Sahara. And uh, here is with some of the people that you probably can recognize uh, in that picture there. Uh, so let me start. I was, of course, as was Jim mentioned, uh, 20 wonderful years at the University of Arizona and working with really some of the greatest people in the water hydrology. And this is a wonderful campus of University of Arizona with the main, uh, the old main as the center of it. And then since 2003, I've been at the University of California, Irvine. And as always, I'm grateful to the many people who have contributed to uh, our, our work, former students, colleagues, and uh, uh, alike. All right. So fusion of uh, science and uh, solutions. Uh, I don't know if my pointer works or not, but. Uh, um, it was the theme, so I thought in that context, uh, to me, uh, it's really fusion uh, depends upon what you're uh, linking the science with solutions. For, for, for scientists, for modelers, their solutions might be in the availability of better data sets that have to be provided. But to me, I take this as solving probably societal problems related to water, and for that reason, to me, hydrologic hazards are one of the two ch challenges that we face, both in terms of droughts and floods. And the other one was water supply requirements. And I think that has been reflected in some of the talks that have been given uh, through this uh, two days, uh, uh, by the way, which have been excellent. I've learned so much. So I will really try to put the emphasis on the first one, although uh, meaning hydrologic hazards. And of course, water supply. Throughout all of these, we are at the mercy of perhaps some kind of prediction 
of the future events, and that has been emphasized in a number of talks that we've heard. I mean, that's why people do models. So it really starts from short range, that is hours to weeks uh, or days that are in the order of flash flood forecasting to mid-range forecasting and long-range forecasting that really goes into the decadal. And water resources planning, particularly areas that still have to build infrastructure, this is really one of the key things that they have to worry about. That so if you're building a reservoir and spending $500 million, how does it really uh, serve your purposes? Uh, maybe up to 100 years or so, I don't know what is used as the economic life or the engineering life of the uh, designs these days. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, but uh, I will try to take you for a little tour of what I've learned through these panels and things that Jim mentioned. And let me start backward, going from the climate side, because a lot of the planning both happen at the long range or the mid-range forecasting level. And I'd like to share some of the experiences and some of the things I've seen, and I'll talk about those. Uh, climate models have become kind of the uh, main thing that uh, we, we have started using. I mean, there's been a shift of paradigm uh, in hydrologic sciences and water resources planning that everybody kind of believes that we, by doing climate, the model downscaling, um, uh, then whether you do it through dynamic downscaling, statistical downscaling, and what method you use, whether you use ensemble method or a single model or run it you know, sequentially for a number of uh, times, or traditional hydrologic, uh, statistical hydrologic methods that have been there with us and have been used, and nobody mentions them, talks about them anymore, that they've been used in the long-term planning of water resources and management. So downscaling. Uh, it's, you know, come to think of it, it's pretty straightforward. You take a climate model output, downscale it to the regional, and maybe even finer resolution. And from a hydrologic point of view, you go all the way from the GCM to RCM and essentially downscale to the hydrologic river basin. So let me talk about one method, of course. The ensemble method has become very popular. And uh, the whole idea is that you generate some future scenarios of precipitation. Because after all, it's all about water. Okay? And then you run the water, um, the, the precipitation out of these models for hydrologic applications. So you may choose different models, you know, three or four or five, and we've seen studies of 13, 14 different models. Each one is initialized for your region, downscaled, and you generate sequence of precipitation through the models coming out of each one of them. And then you create what is known as ensemble of all these things, okay? And from a hydrologic point of view, then you take that ensemble of the precipitations over your basin, and feed them through a hydrologic model, and I'm not biased towards any of them. I just had a picture of uh, the National Weather Service, at least depiction of it, I just put it there. And then you come up with the various scenarios of runoff over the years from present to the future, and this is what is used by the community sometimes to make decisions. And we have a World Bank project now in uh, Morocco, which has been really the the, the requirement that we use these kinds of approaches. And I have my thoughts about that. If you want to privately, I will share. So what do climate models tell us about the future? I mean, this is really important. I mean, if we are relying on them and using them to start driving our hydrologic um, models, so what, what is the type, type, kind of trust we can put in these models? And I use this one. This is from the Hadley Center. And I don't know what version they are now. That was the updated version as of three or four years ago. And this is their older version. This represents essentially 20 or 30 years into the future fields of precipitation. And as you see, the bluer you get, it means that those regions are showing trends of increased precipitation. The reddish areas show those areas are actually showing decrease in precipitation. So if you really focus on a number of areas, and I happen to be now a resident of California, and it's so important for us, if you look at between the two versions of the same model, the old version versus the new that has better physics in it, we suddenly have gone from an area that was to get wetter in the future to an area that is going to get, unfortunately, drier, according to the latest, I mean, this particular CM3 version. And then you can see that scattered through every place. So the 
The key is that there are still significant differences in regional outcomes. And I had the honor of chairing a, a, a review of a report from the USGCRP about four years ago. There were 23 reports. If you go on their website, they're just wonderful. They're nice, glossy pictures. And one of them is the evaluation of climate models. And that study actually points out some of these difficulties, and that comes from the climate modeling community. Uh, recently, uh, a postdoc and uh, a former student, Wei Chu, has done some work with this NARCAP data set, which is really a combination of climate models with the regional climate models for various emission scenarios that data is available to you as well on the web, and did an analysis over the Western United States to see if you look at all these different models, we talk about ensemble, what are they telling us about these things? To cut to the chase, and the story, about half of them seems to point that it actually we will see a downward trend in precipitation in the Western United States, where the other half are pointing towards maybe getting wetter. Okay? And this is, this is what it is. You can do this study yourself, and uh, the paper is, uh, uh, has been submitted. But, uh, but it's remarkable to see that there is so much discrepancy and differences between the various types of climate models and combinations in terms of what they tell us about the future. And we are not alone. You see that if you look at the literature, there is quite a new article, a few articles these days appearing that are putting to question the value of downscaling studies uh, for various planning purposes because they're being pushed uh, so that this is the way to go in the future, which I'm sure it is, but the question is to what extent we as a community can trust and put our uh, uh, decisions uh, in the hands of these things. So I will move on now to the mid-range forecasting, which is really more important for reservoir operation. This is essentially what is known as seasonal to interannual from uh, anything from one month to three months maximum. And if you go to the International Research Institute, there are many, many modeling centers, by the way, that are producing these kinds of forecasts. And uh, IRI was set up some maybe 10, 12 years ago. And uh, those were my younger days being serving on these committees as this sole hydrologist and really feeling intimidated by all these giants doing all kinds of things. And being able to actually get tens and 20 millions of dollars to set up centers like this, which was great. And it was intended to be an international collaboration in the US and was set up between Lamont and Scripps. After two years, the Scripps part was moved to Lamont in, uh, in uh, Columbia, I mean in uh, New York, University of Columbia. And it's good, the history is important to, to really also understand that the vision of having every country to come and put, let's say, a few million dollars towards the center sitting in the United States did not really work that well. So it had to become a, a US activity by, by all means. And we experienced that through GVEX, by the way, that the first continental scale experiment that was to be set up, GSIP, over Mississippi Basin. Everybody was invited to come with a checkbooks and write checks and do the studies here, it didn't happen. That's why GVEX has continental scale experiments over everywhere. Anyhow, that was a diversion. I apologize for that. But if you look at this, any place that is white, and I'm sorry, I just had to download this. It says, it is a forecast, by the way, that is made in June of this year. I just downloaded it a few days ago. And it gives us a prediction, probabilistic prediction, based on multi-model probability forecast of precipitation for July, August, and September. And the color coding is pretty much uh, say, said it, what it is. Two things that you have to recognize, this D, the pinkish area here, says it's dry and there is no forecast, okay? And the dry season, for some reason, these combination models cannot provide much of a forecast. So you can judge to see how much of the planet actually model, at least coming from out of IRI, is unable to provide anything. And the other part is that if it's white, indicates climatology. That's essentially take the average of what climate records tell you, and this is what you're going to be using. So there are only little spotty areas, and unfortunately, the news doesn't seem to be too good. It's always yellow. That means that it's probabilistically a lot of parts of the world that the, the models are, have skill to give you some probabilistic estimates seem to show that it's below normal. 
except for these areas that uh, seem to be, in fact, southwest U.S. I hope the monsoon turns out to be a little better. It's been so far dry. But uh, this is what's, what's available, as well as Koreans and others are producing these things. A revealing study was done by Leavesy. Bob Leavesy used to run the forecasting components of NCEP. And Timo Favoya, uh, in the Bulletin of American Meteorological Science, uh, uh, back in 2008, okay? And it was picked up actually by Science Magazine. I've taken exactly verbatim code from that. And it's a good paper to read. I mean, uh, it says, of the dozens of forecast techniques preferred by government, academic, private sector, climatologists, all, but two are virtually useless. And this is according to this new study that was done at that time. So, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of a message through that uh, line. And it says the only time forecast had any success predicting precipitation was for winter and an El Nino or La Nino event, okay? Which is true, and most of the models are doing that. And this was talking about those two models that had some skill. And I go back to the work that was done by our good friend hydrologists and climate, uh, uh, Kelly Redmond and Roy Cook. They came up with a way of taking the data for much of the uh, at least Western United States, and for the El Nino and La Nino, anything red is, is declared as a La Nino period, and the green area is the neutral, and the blue area represents La Nino, so it's El Nino. And they, we, the study has been done, and it's being implemented in many other places, such as California. This is the south coast part of California that, of course, I live in. And you see that over the years that the data has been available, the precipitation plotted as the ENSO index. And if you look at it, it says that El Nino, and this is the way we've summarized it, winters may be very wet, but not necessarily. There have been El Nino, strong El Ninos that hasn't rained. In fact, it's been pretty poor in terms of precipitation. The second thing you see in the green zone is that there are very wet winters. Very wet winters are typically El Nino winters, but not always as is the case here. We have had very wet periods where they were not in, uh, in the El Nino or non Nino phase. And then you go to one place that really seems the data indicates strongly is the La Nino winters are typically dry by reliability, reliably not wet. It means still leaving a little room for doubt. The bottom line is that if you see there's a good cluster of all those events here, you don't see blues hanging up there. So La Nina is bad news for at least us. If you take the representative eight stations for the entire state of California, which is a big state, uh, story changes, you know? And so that regionality is really an important thing to keep in mind. For every region, these things may have different messages. Again, we have El Nino is a wet, but not always. Uh, again, in the neutral zone, we have had wet years that have not been El Nino or La Nino. And in this particular case, La Nino winters may be very wet, but we've had also La Nino years that have been very dry. Okay, so that signal that we see in the southern part of the state of California and even in Arizona is not really reflected if you look at the data from the entire state. So, and I, I, I apologize if, if I'm rubbing anybody the wrong way, but there's been a lot of push towards use of these models for drought forecasting, or prediction. Now, maybe everybody says, well, you don't understand what is meant by drought prediction. I've been to meetings, unfortunately, there was nothing to tape things, but people made all kinds of promises. And they meant exactly what is the meaning of the word. And to me, a lot of cases, particularly globally looking at it, droughts and lack of precipitations are somewhat correlated. If you don't have rain, how could you, uh, you know, have droughts? So you, your prediction of, a big question that continues to puzzle me is then, if models have difficulty to predict rain, especially at longer time scales, how can one promise to predict droughts? This is something that we can debate, we can discuss, but it's something to, worth, worth to, to think about. And in fact, Siegfried Schubert, one of the people who is expert on drought that works at NASA Goddard, has come up with a nice little diagram in terms of time scale versus spatial scale. And this region is identified as the capability of current models, which is really shorter time scales, but really huge areas. 
And this area, the, the light, the color may not serve me well, is the area where users actually need the information, and it's either low or it's unpredictable. All right? So keep those in mind. So I draw a conclusion at this point. A valid question to ask is given the current state of climate models, especially regional scales, what is the added value of all the downscaling studies and over traditional statistical hydrology methods in water resources studies? It's a question put to the community. We should think about it. And uh, I do that all the time. And I um, liked in some places and hated in other places, but that's life. Uh, so statistical hydrology, OK? I don't know how many places teach it, but unfortunately, it's, it's a vanishing field because they expect enough packages there, the students go and automatically pick it up. When I went to UCLA, I had to have a couple of courses in this stuff. So you take a gauging station, you take the data. At least for the US, we have plenty of data. You remember partial duration series, etc. You draw this, and then you take the peaks and the maximums and fit the probability distribution through it, correct? And from that probability distribution, then you did synthetic hydrology, Mike Fearing's book. I still love it, short, concise to the point or CT hands, and then you assume that was the biggest negative, that you have to assume stationarity, that climate repeats itself. Using the statistics coming from this distribution, you would generate different sequences of either runoff or precipitation. And if you look at this spaghetti plot that I did here, and the spaghetti plot that came out of downscale models, they're pretty much the same things. You know, they represent different uh, scenarios or different realizations. So we've abandoned these techniques, at least in some areas, but not in many areas they still use them. So I pose the question again, what was wrong with these things? Except that, oh, non-stationarity. By the way, the issue of non-stationarity is dead, and Chris Milley agrees. Um, and it's not really that stationarity was ever there. OK? It's an assumption. We make the assumption that watershed is linear in order to use unit hydrograph. We know watersheds are not. So that understanding has to be there that it's really only an assumption. It's not that the way the system you can take the data and look at it. So here's the big thing. You, know, you may have uh, this stationarity question, and that's exactly what goes into the application of these things. This, we know that climate is changing either becoming more variable or there are trends. And so the big question is how much investment and resources are going to try to take statistical methods that actually may be able to deal with the non-stationarity questions and actually try to improve the ways by which we do application of statistic hydrology. All right. So what is my message from this part? Again, presently the accuracy of regional scale predictions falls short of meeting the requirements of water resources planning community. Hardly used. If somebody claims they use it, it's an offline. They never use it in any decision making that I've seen. And uh, unwise to push their use while highly uncertain. And my view is uh, putting my engineering hat on. Uh, a hydrologist is an engineer. And Pete Eagleson probably would appreciate if he sees me hopefully later on. That Factoring resiliency in water resources, system design and planning is still the safest approach to go. You have to have options. You have to be able to deal with these issues. And I think this is really important to be taught even to our students. Finally, to my fa favorite area, which is short-range forecasting, because that's where I spent quite a bit. And I had the pleasure of working with a collaborative work uh, with the National Weather Service. And Jay Day seems to be sitting there and remembers the good old days. So in this case, this is the weather scale, OK? And the weather scales, you deal with floods and river flow forecasting a lot of time. And if you take a watershed with all kinds of gauges, assuming it's nicely gauged, radars in place. VTAC has in, deployed a bunch of his radars on this area. We're capturing every drop of precipitation. We've got geostationary satellites. We've got uh, polar orbiting satellites, put all the data together. This is what nature does, of course. Precipitation falls, the steam gauging that, that goes up, and then 
stops, it, it starts falling. You have to process the precipitation, and QPE is the method to do it. A lot of times you couldn't do it because you wouldn't have the data on time, and the processing has really improved. So you do have the ability, at least for downstream, to make these predictions, but it's never adequate. You don't have enough lead time. So what has been done, numerical weather prediction models, thanks to them. They make predictions at least up to seven days, and now you see QPF is part of their products. You go to their website, you will see it. So you can take the output, or supposedly we are to be able to take the output of the uh, numerical weather prediction models and feed it to our hydrologic model and actually extend the lead time of our forecast. Of course, as you go into the future, the uncertainty increases, and hopefully, as we make advances, we, we are able to reduce that level of uncertainty, and that's a lot of work that students should feel good about, that you can do a lot in this field, by the way. Only thing is that, what is the skill? Okay, uh, HPC, Hydrologic Prediction Center, by the way, which has nothing to do, or does have something, but it's not part of the Office of Hydrology, if I understand it still. It's in the NSEP part. They do skill scores, etc. So if you see, um, these are the different days that the QPF skills are measured. Obviously, the red one represents a one day prediction of precipitation, and uh, green is two day and three day. And you see, skills have started improving, especially when they went to better resolution model, it started going up. But the best that you can do in a one day is about 0 0.5, uh, sorry, 0.3 is the, uh, the skill score. As compared to temperature for five days, now they're almost at 60 or 70 percent in terms of the skill. So in terms of precipitation, we still have a long way to go until people at the river forecast centers and others start trusting them to actually feed their hydrologic models with it. And I think uh, people may have their views on this, but uh, uh, this is my, my thinking. A brief review of the hydrologic modeling is my second part of this talk. That's the capabilities of the forecast. Hydrologic modeling, thanks to Ray Lindsley and Crawford with the Stanford watershed model that uh, really generated a lot of new excitement, uh, has really evolved uh, extensively since then. We'll talk about it. So to me, it has really three components. You have to select a model, or some people prefer to develop because they don't like the other models. They start developing their own models with bells and whistles and with better physics, etc. You have to have the data, both for the input, for evaluation, calibration, and parameter estimation. The notion that people think that we can do hydrology without calibration should not be misunderstood. I think what those colleagues are saying is that hopefully we can get our knowledge of how basin works to such a perfection that from physical and information that we get from remote sensing out there, we can parameterize it. Parameters are with us no matter what you do, and we've got to deal with it, like it or not. So if the world of hydrologic modeling was perfect, Okay, and we were God, and we could do this. These three pieces would fit together, and you could actually have a perfect model. Great ambition to have, fantasy from time to time. But I just put these pictures behind it. This is the real river, and this is perhaps the best the mathematics could be incorporated into one of these models to represent the channel section. You know, completely different. So that tells you that that perfection is not there. But let me go through a couple of things, and I will go quickly through talking about each of these three components. Models, my God, through times we started from engineering design. You remember those API models? Still some textbooks have it. Uh, I know uh, some of my colleagues here are laughing and probably, you know, we started with these things. Uh, very good, effective, and did what it had to do uh, with, with, with uh, Lindsay's work and others and with the advent of first computer and, and Fortran code, you could actually start thinking logically of how water moves through vertically and horizontally and come up with different stores and storages and link them all together. And then distributed models become very popular. And then after that, we see now interface with climate models is these more advanced hydrologic models such as VIC. And um, so we go from lumped to the distributed 
uh, over time, and uh, we have gone from simplistically uh, represented models to more physically based and complex models. The more complexity, the more we have to deal with the complexity. And I put the question marks there because I also heard a number of ideas and things that are perhaps going to be future models that will come. So God knows, we might really have a really exciting 10-year period ahead of us again. At the end of the day, hydrology, unlike atmosphere, uh, you know, atmosphere may be complicated, but you fly over, you see clouds everywhere, everything is uh, maybe nonlinear, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a little bit more homogeneous than what happens over a land surface. So it's all a matter of scales. It's all a matter of different issues you have to deal with. Who are your stakeholders? Because again, we're talking about fusion of science and uh, uh, solutions. And the focus of the hydrometeorology modeling is uh, where hydrology happens, actually. And I'm going to put a little bit of emphasis on this. So lumped models. Uh, some people say, oh, you're talking about lump models. The bottom line is a lot of places are still using them. They're with us unless we have really a good substitute to present. We'll talk about that too. So what happens, rain never falls uniformly over an area. We've seen a couple of thunderstorms here yesterday and, and so on. And so you get lucky. Hopefully you have gauges that captures this precipitation, which is now a guarantee. You take these things and you learn it through hydrology 101 that you can now what, get an equivalent uniform depth over the whole basin and assume rain falls uniformly over the whole area because that's a requirement of a lumped model. Okay, and this is what, what happens. This is rain falling over the area. This is the hydrograph that is generated and measured at this gauging station. Now I've lumped all the precipitation. I select my hydrologic model. Okay, feed that precip through it, assuming that I've got reasonable parameters in the model. And then I come up with my forecast or prediction of what that model spits out. Uh, that may be good. That's been the argument that we can probably do better. People have said, all right, let's split the catchment into smaller catchments and call semi-distributed approach. And essentially, the yellow line represents that. And you link all these things together because now represent the spatial variability heterogeneity a little better. But the push has been to go with all the remote sensing data, et cetera, that hopefully will help us to go more towards a fully distributed model. And again, I apologize for simplifying the concept so much. And uh, so what happens, so oh, I went too fast. Uh, with, with that, you hopefully get much closer to the reality, OK? And sometimes over parameterization if you don't have the information, it could do you damage. So there is a point of diminishing return, how much you want to go distributed. One has to, to be careful about these things. And we've seen people go as far as they can, then they have to back up because they don't have the precip data or this or that. So review some recent model evaluation studies. Okay, uh, This was actually a paper by Edwin Wells for a while, worked at the National Weather Service. And I had the honor of having him as a student, great guy. And uh, it was actually published in BAMS, was featured article, and uh, story about how we got this paper to a point where it could be published is one that we can talk offline. You know, this is the human dimension aspects of things that could be controversial and may reflect bad uh, on, on different things. But the bottom line is the science magazine, for some strange reason, liked it, picked it up, and it was says the hydrologic verification, a call to action. It, it wrote a little article, says river forecasting shows no detectable progress in two decades. And they actually showed something out of the dissertation of Edwin Wells. And uh, I'll tell you that Edwin had really a difficult time to find his data of forecast kept by the various river forecast centers in order to do his study. But because he was an internal guy, he was able to find enough data to do it, which is a lesson. Don't throw things out. We've got to keep these things. And that has not been a culture until 12, 13 years ago before AHAPS. So the dotted line represents persistence, OK? And that's the analysis for one of the gauges that he had from 93 to 2002. So the, the story is that at, at the third day, day one, day two forecasts by models were better than persistence. So what is persistence? is that whatever is the flow in the river at this hour, at this minute, I assume, for the next three days, it's going to stay constant. 
Okay? And it shows that the models and persistent pretty much did pretty, this pretty much the same you know, for the third day forecast. And interestingly enough, I just reviewed a dissertation from a university in Singapore and for the lower Mekong del Delta. And the number three appeared there too. And it wasn't the same class of models, used more artificial neural network type models and more statistically based models. So it's, there's something there. So, and also what is revealing is that over this entire period, it stayed pretty much constant rather than the errors going down. And that's a reflection of the dire conditions my colleagues at the National Weather Service have had because they don't have enough staff to, and scientists. And when I come to buildings like this, I love all these people here. But it gives me inferiority complex that how much money is being spent in other parts where our Office of Hydrology perhaps doesn't have enough staff except to troubleshoot day-to-day -day activities. And they haven't been able to implement some of the improvements that have been recommended by the scientific community. But hopefully we'll get there. And the second one was known as the intercomparison BMIP study, which is the, the Distributed Model Intercomparison Project. And for those of you who were in that side of the room yesterday, uh, we had a little bit of a discussion uh, with Martin Clark, uh, at least on this, because I raised this. The MIP study, first phase one, showed that there was no more major difference between the performance of lumped and distributed models. And this study came because people in the academia were de developing distributed models, complained that the weather service was not really getting out of its own routine, it still applies lump model, there's more advances. So they designed this study, everybody with the distributed model was given the data, fine tune it, bring it, and then we will do a comparison of the data on some independent part of the record. So it was pretty objectively done. You can complain about any study, I guess, these days. But anyhow, the bottom line was that there wasn't much of a detectable difference. A second DMIP was done and recently published. And here are some of the conclusions for them that. What best overall performing models combine the strength of the so-called conceptual models and the so-called physically based models, distributed models. Distributed models that performed well for base and outlet simulations were generally able to perform, perform well at interior simulation points, which is really a strength of distributed models. You can now go back to the interior points and see what the conditions are if you didn't have gauge. And this is helpful for the on-gauge basin kind of studies. And distributed models require high quality data for optimal use, which is okay. Christy Franz, I think she's someplace there, who did her doctoral degree with me. Again, a great study. And compared the strength of both the temperature based models for snowmelt versus the energy balance models. And her results showed for 13 years of studies. I'm just using one season of her data, is that the, uh, essentially energy balance models had greater simulation errors. And as you see, the performance is pretty much the same. It's not that significantly different. And more skill in probabilistic predictions of this SWE, uh, snow water equivalent, if initialized with observed SWE. So you really do need that data. And data availability is the biggest problem. And frankly, when she was trying to do this analysis. Everybody says, well, there's so many people, X in Iowa, Idaho, et cetera, have good distributed data. You call them, it wasn't available. So the difficulties of finding the data to do these evaluations sometimes tells us something about what we have to do. So coming to community hydrologic modeling. My own personal view is probably a good idea. But before we do that, there's much lessons to be learned from past attempts. MMS, an attempt by the US Geological Survey colleagues here, and George Leavesley and others were involved with that. There have been a number of these things. And the question is, unfortunately, negative things don't get published, right? Failures, nobody, no editor would want to see those things. But there is vast amount of information to be gained from those things. And I hope they engage, you engage those people and try to see what was it that didn't work and learn from that lesson before we launch new ideas. Because otherwise, five years, 10 years from now, I probably retired, won't be invited again, but you will be sitting here talking about the same things. 
And Dave Goodrich was another one that you mentioned the other night. I forgot MMS and the other one was OMS. Okay. Anyhow, let me move to, oh my God, I got a lot to cover. Okay. Parameter estimation. But thanks to Tom Don yesterday said, hey, Sarush, you can go on. And he was a little bit over time, and I'm sure the chair will, will forgive me for that. Okay. Calibration. Okay. Chapter two in the modeling. You select the model structure, and you know you have to have models have parameters. Uh, National Weather Service has 13 parameters that have to be calibrated. Okay, it may have more, 17 or so, but or 21, but some of them are you can you can assign them from information. So let's go back to statistics 101 universal set. And for me, a basin is what we are trying to do. We are trying to simulate a basin through a hydrologic model. And let's assume, in fact, you have everything and know everything about that watershed. And I call it the truth. That's acting God. Okay? And then you choose from various classes of models. I just hypothetically put two. Class modeling mod, conceptual, maybe distributed model, etc. And they're all parametric. And theta represents those parameters. And a lot of times, consulting companies and others give you default parameter values for your regions. I mean, that's why they charge you to do this. And they give you these. So in fact, the distance between the truth and what your model can do is based on how you plug in those parameters into your model and get it. And that's the distance. Okay. Again, I'm sorry to trivialize it so much. Uh, and then calibration, if it works, should get you right to the boundary of what the performance of that model could be by specifying and identifying good parameters for it. But you can't expect to go beyond that because that's the limit of what, what your model can provide you with. Okay? We've got people who work on improving the physics okay, of infiltration and layers of models, et cetera, et cetera. In that case, Maybe there is good news for us. As they make those advances and improve the model, then hopefully with improved calibration tools, we can get this distance to the truth a lot better. And this is the idea behind distributed hydrologic modeling, because you represent heterogeneity a lot better. I apologize if I'm on your way here. Anyhow, so comes to calibration. When I was a student of John Dracup, and he got me on this, and thanks to Richard Ibbett's dissertation back in the University of London that was uh, given to me by Dave Doughty in a visit to his office because John said go and talk to him. You know, he knows something about this and they got me started on this topic. So what you need is, this is not a debate between manual calibration or automatic calibration. I worked on automatic calibration. And I love those arguments and discussions I had with Bernash. Uh, because he was the man with the manual calibration, fine-tuning things. And, but anyhow, it requires three pieces, objective function or fitting criteria or error function. You need a search algorithm, and then you need sensitivity analysis to really decide whether you're at least in the ballpark or not. So with the objective function or error criteria, you create the parameter space in which the search has to take place. All right? Search algorithm is the one that searches the space to get you to the good parameters. And the rest of it is uh, uh, the work that needs to be done. And of course, there's always problems with identifiability. Quite a bit of work has been done. I'm just summarizing them, the first order approximations besides our own work. Kuchero and others have worked on this. Uh, generalized uh, likelihood and certainty estimation, the glue of Bevan co-workers. Jasper Root, uh, um, who, who uh, has done quite a bit of work with the uh, MC, MC, which represents the bimodality of the distribution of the parameters. So these are all there, and I'm not going to get into too much discussion. The literature is rich. The difficulties in global optimization are as follows. You choose a criteria, OK? And th that loop, I won't go to it because it's uh, too much time. But Usually, the parameter space that you're doing is that's multiple regions of attraction, uncountable local optima. Anyhow, it's a mess. Okay, it's a mess, truly mess. In, and when you have 13 parameter space, I don't know what it takes you to drink or 
or, or, or do to imagine in a 13 dimensional space how these parameters behave and interact. Uh, I, I imagine that from time to time myself. But anyhow, let me take again the soil moisture accounting model, the weather service, because I'm more familiar with it. Uh, these are the things that you see in that model, okay? Incredible number of local optima, okay? And you see roughness and regions like this, and you know, imagine you're trying to find that gold nugget <laughs> somewhere in that. And this is only in two of the parameters, intersection of two of the parameters. I'm not really going beyond that. You have flatness, curvatures, etc. So it's really difficult, and it provides challenge to optimization algorithms. And in fact, it's two of the parameters of UZK and LZPK. Please refer to the paper for, for their definition. But anyway, there are two parameters, synthetic study. Some values were assumed for them. And then if you start from 100 different starting points, you essentially end up in 100 different final points because of what I described, you know, the difficulty in the space to find it. So the whole notion of uniqueness of parameters is great in our head. And if we were God to know where it was, otherwise optimization algorithms cannot find it. And this was using a search algorithm, Nelder and Mead. And what happens is when you have tons of local optima all over the place, it depends on where you start your original search. If you're lucky, you may hit the truth. But in many cases, you may end up in local optima, and that's exactly what I was showing over there. Simple. Take it bucket model, and I teach that, and I've taught that for so many years, and I think it's really still fundamental, because that's still a fundamental aspect of most of these models. If my bucket never fills, I have no information about this parameter that allows me to figure out how much overland flow or spill I would have, okay? And, but if I have enough precipitation fills the bucket, then it gives me some information. So that's the bimodality of the model. If I try to do my calibration and do plot the search environment, this is the kind of response surface I get. So if I start with a large CVAX value, the best it can do is give me maybe the K value, but the CVAX itself is wrong. Now, if you have data like this that's sim that's, uh, that stimulates or activates the modes of the model, obviously the conditions are changed. So, the interplay between model and calibration are extremely important and have to be kept in mind. Hoshin Gupta, brilliant guy. Back in 83, we studied the National Weather Service model very briefly. The percolation equation is the heart of that model. Seven parameters. I'm talking about two of them, Z and X. It takes a special case, which is physically impossible, to try to identify those two parameters. Because in most cases, the data that you have limits you to this amount. Because you cannot really have water in excess of this upper reach. In order, and then so you, you can, you have data here, you would fit perfectly here. And that's what your calibration does for you. But your Z and X could be completely off. And that's why you see these flat regions in this thing, okay? And this is the condition that actually has to take place, which is impossible. We cannot switch off infiltration going into the deeper soil, it, it takes that in order for it to activate it, and that's not, impos that's not possible. So these are the type of conditions you see due to that kind of problem you have. And if you start from different places, you may end up at different places that op optimality tells you good, and you can't blame an optimization algorithm for it, but reality is you may not have hit the right parameter. Okay, Gwynion Duan. Another pleasure student to work with, with Hoshin that time, came up with the shuffled complex evolution algorithm, uh, which is used. You know, it's down, downloaded maybe more than 1,000, and it's great that it's uh, being used. And has generated a lot of excitement. To just show, remember those parameters? Using his method, which is a combination of random search, etc., actually did pretty well against all odds, okay? And we have found some difficulty with that from time to time. And there's always another bright person comes along. And it's Wei Chu. He found that there were some degeneracies with Duan's method. And uh, what happens is that the 
you're doing the search, you fall into this trap, and you're not able to find it. A very logical thinking that he did with just principal component uh, method has been able to solve this. And that uh, has been published, I guess, uh, with six papers in optimization journal. But also, don't forget, you can't expect too much out of calibration because traditionally in hydrology, we are using runoff as the only source of information to do our calibration. It's unfair to put everything on and the burden on that one source of information. So if you have models these days, land surface models, you can get multiple outputs also coming out. So why not use the multiple outputs to do your calibration? And I'll be very quick. Again, uh, Luis Pastillas, Doug Boyle, Hoshin, again, a great group of people. and takes me back to the good old days of Arizona. In a multiple objective, multi-criteria estimation, essentially you create a Pareto optimality set by combining all these different outputs and using them in order to do your calibration. And example was the over the arm cart site using BATS model of the Dickinson because those are the only models that have these things. You know, like sensible heat, latent heat, ground temperature, and soil wetness. And as you see, if you do single calibration on a single source of output, you may get one right, two, but maybe completely messed up the other ones. As you go, you calibrate on this, you get temperature excellent, but then you have already messed up your estimates of others. So with that method that we're talking about here with the multiple objective, you actually don't get perfect everything, but at least in a Pareto optimality set, you have a good combination of parameters that perhaps will be serving your model better. And then when I see, I go to talks, 12 layer soil models, 12, 10 layer uh, uh, snow models, etc. I admire those people, you know, if they can actually figure out ways, and that's why we see usually assigned default values, and I'm not so sure how a default value over a region like here or deserts of Iran, uh, which I come from, etc., can be the same. So you have to really go through a lot and do a lot of work, and calibration is a big challenge. So the question is parsimonious models have to be kept in mind. Okay, now data, and I hope that I will finish on time. Jim, don't worry. Great, so in that case, I've been given the green light. Adequacy of hydrologic observations for, 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 model, exactly, for model input and validation. Really crucial. And this meeting has demonstrated how much people have talked about this. This, to me, is the biggest challenge. And I'm not going to talk about runoff. I'm not going to talk about others. I talk a little bit about things that we have been engaged with in the past few years. Precipitation. Picture taken from my old house in Tucson, Arizona. A storm happening over the the mountains over there, okay? And uh, that says it all. That says it all. Airport in Tucson picked zero that day. Houses were washed away here. Damage was done, okay? This is what I'm talking about when we talk about resolution, okay? Distributed models are great if you have this kind of data to feed into them. Anyhow. And this is the monsoon season, by the way. It's exactly uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago there. So to me, precipitation measurement is one of the key hydrometeorological challenges we face. And it has to be a push towards spatial and temporal resolutions. You have to get them to find a resolution. We're talking about hyperscale, hyper resolution models of one kilometer. OK. Where do we come up with? thing that has to feed that one kilometer. This is going to be a big challenge. Well, we have options. We have a number of things that, at least in terms of precipitation, rain gauges. We've had radar. We have satellites now. Which one do you trust? I guess each one has its pluses and negatives. And uh, just to briefly discuss this, Bob Maddox, it's, I don't think, out of date, because that's the condition. That's the next generation of radars that have been installed. By the way, gauges, 
daily precipitation, usually now we have hourly that is coming in. On the average, Western United States, one gauge per 600 kilometers square. So please try to think of that square that I'm talking about. Some places may have a lot of them, but there are regions that don't have any of them. On the average, this is what it works out. Urban areas obviously have it more. Mountainous areas don't have as much. And that's where most of the precipitation happens, particularly in the West. And we are deprived of knowing exactly how much it is. Radar, please pay, pay attention to this. Three kilometers above the Earth is what you see with this radar in the Western United States. OK, these are, this is represent the coverage because mountain blockage and others don't allow you to capture anything with the radar. If you drop it down, and you have to drop it down to the level of ground to be relevant to hydrology, OK? It's the rain that falls on the ground that causes the flood. And that's what's being observed up there, two kilometers above the ground. Area, unfortunately, shrinks. And if you go down to 1,000 meters, one kilometer, this is the area of coverage you would get in radar in the West, OK? Now, maybe we get to a point where VTAC Inc. Incorporated, we'll have zillions of these little things. We can put our radars back of our houses and be able to measure. It would be fantastic if we get to that. But these are the limitations we have with the existing systems. Walnut Gulch, thanks to Dave Goodrich and his colleagues, it's perhaps closest coming to the truth because they have gauges, rain gauges, well maintained, if they can keep the hunters away from time to time shooting at them. And that's about what? One gauge per kilometer square or? Go on figure. So it's not that bad. Close enough. OK. Radar in Tucson is, I guess, what, about 80 kilometers away? Optimal distance, but there's some vertical block. All right. He, here is this storm, August 11, 2000. Efrat Morin was this visiting uh, student from Israel that did this work. This is what radar picked up. This is what the rain fell on that gauge network that Dave just mentioned. OK. 70% overestimation coming from radar. OK, what does it do to your estimate of runoff? Luckily, nobody reads at the mouth of this little Walnut Gulch experimental watershed. But I'm trying to demonstrate that there is always these challenges and uncertainties that we have to face. And it can do simulation studies, just the 25% error in your precipitation with any kind of hydrologic model you take. There's huge uncertainties that you get out of what? your runoff estimates. So this is something to keep in mind. Satellite-based precipitation, well, this is where my bias is. And you will see it. Uh, what do we have? What are our choices? Geostationary satellites were the first generation of things that started providing us with information from space, more for climate studies at 250 kilometer resolution. And it's based on the infrared and visible channels of geostationary satellites, 35,000 kilometers above the Earth. We have now the polar orbiting ones. Advantage, good temporal and spatial resolutions. Very good coverage. Disadvantage, receives mostly cloud top information and indirect estimation of precipitation. OK, it's been always a negative point with these things, and I'll show that. Higher the clouds, the colder, and this is what these algorithms that you can develop with IR will tell you. Convective storms that puff up to 60,000 feet, that's great, because that's where the rain is, actually. You, you see them after the thunderstorm that I showed you. You could have high clouds, cirrus clouds. Or you could have very low clouds, but warm conditions. And with IR, unfortunately, you don't pick these things. False alarm. You're guessing rain, but it's not falling. With this condition, tons of rain is falling, but IR is seeing it warmer and says no rain. So false alarm rates are very high. But this is the only one that perhaps we do convection is very good. We can see those things. All right, microwave. We have now a good number of passive microwaves. Response directly to hydrometeors and penetrates into the clouds. These are polar orbiting. Unfortunately, when you go over an area, you get a snapshot, you have to wait for the second one to come in 24 hours, so you really have only two shots a day. More accurate estimates. The disadvantage is low temporal and spatial resolutions. All right, 
heterogeneous emissivity of land is a big problem. But tons of people are trying to work on these things, trying to get it, at least in those resolutions. And Colorado State University down uh, north of us is really good at that. Active radar. TRIM. Everybody talks about TRIM. It's an active radar in space. Okay, sends signals, gets it back. FE has worked on it and knows probably more about it than I do, but anyhow. Advantages is more accurate, good spatial resolution. You can actually do almost like a CAT scan of a storm. But it's that, again, goes and you have to wait another 12 hours for it to come. Hydrologically speaking, storms could come within one hour and come and gone, and unfortunately, you may have missed them with these kinds of radars. Disadvantage, poor temporal resolution, and we don't really have much of a thing. Our work, and we started from as hydrologists trying to get into a community that laughed at us at the beginning. We said we need to come with satellite precipitation that is not 250 kilometers or not 25 kilometers, but we've got to get it close to what the radar puts out. All right, and Colin Xu was the doctoral student at the time. Uh, uh, it's great to have him as a colleague, as a professor in residence now at the University of California, Irvine. And we came up with a, what is known as the Persian system. It has nothing to do with me being a, a Persian, but they came up with this acronym, Precipitation Estimation for rem from Remotely Sensed Information Using Artificial Network, which is the core of our model, takes the IR, and also uses the microwave information, a combination of the two, try to provide high resolution information. Please visit our website, go and say CHRS UCI, it takes you to our website and you will see it. And we now work with collaboration with UNESCO, almost near real time. The latency is anywhere from 40 minutes to uh, one hour and 10 minutes because we have to run the algorithm on the NESDES machine because we don't have access to the data from Europe and others as an academic, but governments have agreements. We get the data back. Somebody showed, and I think uh, uh, it was an Andy uh, showing the National Weather Service with a few of these terminals trying to do all the good forecasting. All of our data that you see here, four kilometer resolution precipitation every 30 minutes is on one desktop. Okay, that is, uh, if that desktop goes bad, uh, we probably will have out of business. Now I have to go to Jay and apply for funds to buy a computer to try to save my data. Okay, it's as I said, high resolution, many features provided to users for public domain. You can zoom into areas. By the way, we now have translations, we have tutorials how to use it because we can't be everywhere. And in various languages, if you go to the website, you'll see it. You can zoom in. You can actually come up with point estimates for an area. You can actually come up with a watershed study because many places, they have to take the information to their bosses. And these are based on the feedback from UNESCO that we got. We've tried to add to this. You can get estimates of actually heavy precipitation everywhere. Yes, like everybody else, we've got also a Google Earth version of it too. Okay. Far from being accurate, I'm not trying to oversell. There's a lot of things that needs to be done in order to improve this, and I showed already some of them, the false alarm rate, rate and, and so on and so forth. And the higher the resolution, the higher the uncertainty. You get to coarser resolution of one degree by 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer, your uncertainties go down, but not completely to zero. It's still uncertain. The resolutions we're talking, we want to do hydrologic modeling, puts us in this corner. And this is a huge challenge for us to face because I don't think you can do adequate hydrologic modeling with not having the main input to the engine, which is precipitation, okay? Satellite-based precipitation, very, I think they're promising. Here is an example from Corai's work and, uh, you know, Comparing it over a basin, rain gauge, radar, and the data that he used from Persian, the statistics are there. The black line represent the runoff out of the basin in all cases, and each of those lines represent if you use that precipitation as an input. Six of one and half a dozen of the other is what my travel agents always uses, and that's so far this is the condition that you see. Validation, the good thing. People are doing it. You like it or not, all the people who have algorithms, NASA has it, NESDES has it, they have different focus. We have more of a 
hydrologic focus. Uh, you can go there and judge for yourself. And sometimes we are doing horrible. And so does everybody else from time to time. So these are, US is doing it. They're taking the algorithm data every day, our products, and putting it on the web. And you can judge to see how good or bad they are. Let me just go to the la very last phase of my talk, which is observed versus model generated data. Something that has started bothering me a little bit. Maybe it takes me back to the Eaglesons and others who taught us things. I see more and more people relying on model generated data as though it is actually being observed. Okay? Reanalysis data, this data, that data. And they're not, it's, web, has, web is great. You can go and get it. Uh, before we had to go to the USES water supply books to write the numbers down, my God. This is, that year period is gone. So the web is very dangerous. And we have to have really words of caution. So studies over Central California irrigation, thanks to Lee Jalun Lee. Two modus products. That's the closest you can come for ET observations. Because as much as people tell you they have in situ observations, they don't exist. And even though there are some scattered data, it's a hard one to come to by. But the resolutions we're talking about, you have to have ways by which. So this is the modus. It picks up, you know, it's cooler areas here. And that more um, evaporation has happening because that's the irrigation area. The one, this is University of Washington, our colleagues processing the, the, the modus data to get it there. And this is from Montana, Steve Running. Their product, obviously, there's still quite a bit of differences between the two different data products. But in general, they capture the patterns, which is good. Now, North American, OK, reanalysis, OK, model generated data. I mean, please, a lot of people are using this to do, and great papers are coming, get to science, nature, etc. But that's the quality of the data that is coming out of some of these reanalysis information. LDAS, I take pride as, as chair of GVEX. We've always promoted and pushed LDAS, and it's great and as, as probably a future. But you have to also know its limitations. A lot of these high resolution, hyper things we're talking about are going to rely on products like this in order to be able to drive those models. And my point is that have a little will to doubt the quality of the data. This is the old version of LDAS. Recently, they have updated it. It's getting a little better than the previous one, but still, it needs a lot of work to, to be done. So from time to time, we never find balance between studies of model, parameter estimation, and data. Sometimes, maybe in my view at the present time, we've gotten parameter estimation to where it has to be, methods, OK? I think the question is, is it the data that should be emphasized at the present time, or this is the models that should be emphasized, or both of them, OK? Or it should be only the data itself, because we can't do much more modeling if we don't have the data for the model. So we have to be very careful. And the challenge is for my colleagues at NSF and others who try to develop programs and actually encourage, perhaps, people getting engaged in these things. So emergence of new visions. Hyper-resolution was mentioned yesterday and last night. You know, this is the problem with PowerPoint. You have to end up not enjoying the dinner, going to a movie. You have to come and work on your damn talk. Hyper-resolution modeling. I mean, it's a paper that is now a lot of people talking about it. One kilometer resolution we want to do. CSDMS was mentioned yesterday by John, uh, I guess. That's good. These are all good. But please, lessons to be learned from recent attempts. In Sahara, we made such an attempt. It never gets published because it didn't go anywhere. OK, it was to connect from high res low resolution climate all the way to subsurface, three-dimensional Los Alamos, all the wonderful computers, et cetera. Too many difficulties, too many challenges, and I don't think it went anywhere. By then, of course, I was kicked out in Asa, um, Sahara. I was in California, so I, I've checked with my colleagues. They said, well, you know, it, it really didn't go too much. Remote sensing seems to be the main driver of these ideas. 
Okay, if you look at Eric Wood and ex colleagues, this is where it comes. But it cannot be the only driver. You have to look at things in the balance, okay? Uh, even, even remote sensing, you have to know the limitations of your information and data. Sharing a few experiences, believe me, this is my last slide. And uh, I've had the fortune over the years, as Jim was kind enough to mention, uh, to be involved with quite a few committees and quite a few opportunities to learn from others. From the days I served on the Climate Research Committee uh, of the National Academy, feeling totally uh, outnumbered by all these giants of uh, climate modeling and, and, and others, atmospheric science. So it gave me a lot of inferiority complex, especially t when they were talking about the magnitude of these climate modeling centers and millions and millions of dollars. And my experience was in hydrology. Where are we with this thing? And as soon as you raise your hand, sometimes towards the end, I got a little bit feisty and I would argue. And the good thing is the next time you're not on those panels, OK? <laughs> I had the pleasure of being the chair of GVEX for about six years, seven, eight, nine years, my god. I was blamed by the rest of the global energy and water cycle community that I was making it a hydrology project. Okay, which is not true. And if you are chair of something, my friends, have tough skin, okay? If nobody, if everybody hates you, you're doing something wrong. If everybody likes you, you're probably doing something wrong. The balance is that there is a group that probably their stuff may be not getting as much emphasis as it did before and you're emphasizing things that were ignored for a number of years, then you're probably doing something good and history will tell. In GVEX, I learned one thing, particularly in the United States. There are different agencies and there are different reactions to these kinds of activities. I hate to say it, and I hope this is not the last of my chance of getting anything out of NSF. My biggest difficulty was working with my NSF colleagues not from the hydrologic community of NSF, from the atmospheric community. Every time we told them, Clivor is another program. Tons of money all over the place. We said, well, no, how about a little bit for these aspects of the energy and water cycle? Oh, you guys have to define your boundaries. Are you small scale, large scale? Oh, we did that. Then it was something else. Anyhow, I, I, I'm out of so I don't know exactly. It's the mindset because a lot of those folks come from traditional atmospheric sciences, ocean sciences, and see things a little bit differently from hydrology. We are a great poster child. And we are used a lot. Everybody wants to sell new missions, new programs, new modeling centers. They're doing climate modeling for higher resolution to solve water resources problems. Okay. And I think we have to be very careful not to become instruments of these other groups. It's great to be helpful to other colleagues. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. I haven't seen the other way around, I have to tell you. From NRC AHAPS committee, I, was the, I had the pleasure of chairing it when Advanced Hydrologic Prediction System was being designed, maybe eight, nine, 10 years ago, Jay, I forgot. But the first meeting of the committee, okay, in Washington, D.C., in the NRC building. All agency representatives came and made a pitch and presented theirs and very supportive of the National Weather Service. The last person was a good colleague from Army Corps of uh, Engineers, okay, and the Pacific Northwest, all right. And we presented and was very supportive. At the end, I don't know, somehow, I, before the break, I asked the question, well, with all that positive things, do you see a future where you folks will start also using this if the, so much the government is to invest on an advanced hydrologic research. So, heck no. We have different requirements. We have different things and we have to have our own set of models. So my message to Don, which unfortunately these program giants never stay for meetings to listen to things. I hope maybe he watches the video in the future sometimes. <laughs> he has nothing else to see. Is that those are the type of challenges he will face as he's trying to push this, and I'm glad you guys as an academic committee represent that. We still have these boundaries, and uh, it's uh, difficult. And there are still, I think, other organizations of the government that are not engaged with this thing. 
from Sahara, from NOAA Science Advisory Board. Believe it or not, I was the first hydrologist to serve on the NOAA Science Advisory Board. Great pleasure, big names, so I at least know a few people when I run into them. And that taught me a lot, okay? And what I learned through that is there is different scales. The most I could do as a hydrologist in the five years I served on this, when it got to Admiral Lautenbacher, who became as the administrator of NOAA, was that he saw me in a meeting and said, Sarush, I'm glad to report to you we got water as one of the main missions of the agency. And it's the fourth line that says we, we will do things to serve the water community. I said, Admiral, it's great. But what did you also authorize and dedicate to help the National Weather Science Hydrology Program and others? We just look at all the buildings around this place. Look at all the research centers in uh, NOAA's research centers in different universities and others with $20 million budgets. How many hydrology centers exist like that? We don't have any. Well, he said, that's the task for the next administrator. Okay? And by then, of course, I talked. I said, this is the type of thing you get. So that means that we have to do a lot of work in order to get on somebody's radar scope. From Sahara, that was a fantastic experience. That gray hair wasn't there, and I don't think it's a nonlinear relationship at how quickly it became white. The demands put to us, and again, it's not a criticism, Many of these new projects, especially if they're large scale, have to be everything for everybody. You have to have all kinds of components and everything is reasonable, but interdisciplinarity has its limits. You still have to make sure that you maintain the core of the discipline, otherwise you water it down by the time you distribute the model, nobody's got anything to do anything useful. And this is something that I think we've maybe gone too far and maybe going. Uh, still in the same direction, but that was for me the biggest challenge of how do you balance things and how you keep everybody happy to do something that would actually move the science forward as well. From Kwasi, I had the pleasure, I guess at one point, to be the chair of the senior advisory group for Kwasi. Again, uh, there the only thing that I want to say is again, there's too much pressure on Kwasi to be everything for everybody. And Honestly, I think we as the hydrologic community have to stand up and say, hey, we've got our own problems. We need to place the focus on this. You know, it's great to be doing eco-hydrology and, you know, there is a lot of hydrology, hydrometeorology, hydroclimatology, geohydrology, hydrogeology. All of those are great. And then now there are three levels of uh, things to the hydrology attached. They're good, but you have to also maintain, and I think, I hope, what UCAR has done for the atmospheric research is expected, and boy, you do have a, a pretty tough task ahead of you. With that, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Soros, for the very pragmatic uh, point of view here. Two issues I would like to bring up. In your first part of the talk, where you were talking about longer time scale, you presented the comparison in the West that half of the models predict less mean annual precipitation, half above. But you know, hydrology, of course, is not about mean annual precipitation. Yeah. So. It would be worth, if you've not done this study, I would be very interested to know, do they agree on some other components that are related to what really matters to us? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question, Effie. I think that, that, that the highest level in which you can do the comparison is the, the mean field. If you get into more specifics, things get worse, like anything else. The finer the resolutions they get, the more uncertain it becomes. Nobody's done that study. Uh, probably it's worth, but you've got to chop up the whole 
Western United States to different parts. And as I showed with the El Nino, La Nino, Southern California with the whole state are completely two different things in terms of the signal for La Nina. So yeah, but it needs to be looked at. Time. One other quick point. You made the, uh, the point, rightly so, that we are used by the climate community because they get the big money on the basis of floods. But in your presentation to banking the point that downscaling the climate models might not do uh, better than statistical downscaling presents us as users of the climate models. That is, give us the, the uh, climate output and we're going to downscale and use it for hydrology. So what we really have to make an effort is that climate models cannot improve without considering the hydrologic cycle at all scales very much uh, you know, integrated. So we're players with them in the whole picture. I'm not disputing that, but I'm saying, please, the focus of the talk, I removed almost quite a bit to show, actually, as hydrologists, if you work with these things. We've done it over the irrigation area of California. But just realistic irrigation information that the farmers are using, vis-a-vis -vis totally ignoring it, which a lot of climate models do, or those who have decided to incorporate irrigation in the Central Valley, assume flood irrigation, you know, the whole nine months or so, it's all water, which is not true. There was a data set, believe it or not, nobody looks at it, and Jalun found it, and shows that by just incorporating realistic, you could get the amount of ET and a lot of things more reasonable with some of the information. The papers are in JGR, under Solution et al. Uh, so, Effie, your point is well taken. I was only looking at the fusion of science and solutions. We are trying to help our water resources communities. And when you go to, as a consultant or somebody, and everybody wants you to do magic because everybody's told them, other, somebody was there three days earlier talking about what climate models can do for you guys, you idiots, how come you're not using it? And then they ask you, why don't you do it? Now, that's my dilemma with the World Bank. You, you tell them that you're probably wasting your money. I say, you want the project or you don't want it? If you don't, somebody else will do it. Okay? This is, this is but, but working with them is absolutely necessary. Andy. Sarush, uh, great. I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you've had a long um, perspective on the Weather Service, and I think quite right, rightly the Weather Service views you as a real friend to them from the science community. But I wonder what you would, if you'd offer any thoughts on how we, we avoid going another 30 years of stagnation in the practice of uh, river forecasting for water management. You know, you, you folks, and you, I don't envy you at all. I mean, you're in such a difficult position. You're an operational agency. You have to provide information to people. But you cannot provide information outside of what's available to you and your means, okay? Believe it, the, the, talk, the part that I talked about of Hoshin's work with the percolation equation, we have presented a solution for that. Not that it may make that much difference because it's only in the two parameters there. I don't know about the interaction between the, one of those parameters with 13 other or 12 others. But those solutions are very easy to implement. And unfortunately, over the years, People have been so busy in the lab to troubleshoot forecasts and help river forecasts, have had no time to implement anything. And that's what really makes me feel inferior. The inferiority complex again comes in. Just go down the federal building there. I mean, you go to wings of these with fantastic opportunities, scientists, postdocs doing things. That, uh, and we don't have that kind of thing. So I commend, you know, uh, Don and uh, Gary and others trying to push this integrated approach. It won't be easy. Uh, it's, as I said, you know, bring everybody on board to be collaborative is, is something that will take a lot of time, patience, and diplomacy. And you can't really force it down the throat of people. You have to have them on board. And I am optimistic. I think uh, we, will, we will make progress. Yeah, thank you very much for a very comprehensive, you know, view of things. So, 
but I, I, I have two questions. So, as a mechanical engineer, how could you stand all these uncertainties? You get used to it. You drink good wine and uh, conversation with friends, and it's 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 it is a huge thing. I know uncertainties with respect. You mean the information data? Is that what you're talking about? Or my uncertainty about my future? Because <laughs> I started as a mechanical engineer, ended up. Well, my colleagues, mechanical engineers, they cannot tolerate more than like two percent errors, you know, and. Yes. yes, because, you know, they deal with different things. Uh, you know, astrophysicists and others. I mean, imagine, uh, I'm invited to JPL and I'm honored by that for the 5th of uh, uh, the month, August, when uh, the, the new Mars rover is going to land. They know exactly the hour. They've invited us between 8 and 10 to be there because it's going to land. So the physics is so good. They know precisely what time it's going to land there when we don't know three hours from now where precipitation is going to fall. Yeah, uncertainties are there, but you know, let's hope that we can all work to reduce them. So the second you know, question is a, is a request. So since you are in the forecasting you know, business and uh, um, you are well calibrated by your experience, uh, fast forward 10 years, where will Quasi be your most optimistic prediction? Quasi, uh, Quasi has a challenge. I mean, real, reality is that, as was mentioned by Rick or yourself, uh, or maybe Vijay last night, uh, I wish our community was such that 15, 20 years ago we had started. Times are tougher, okay? And honestly, I wish we could find a sugar daddy or sugar mommy would give us quasi a hundred million dollars. And I would, the first thing I would do, I would hire companies or groups or lobbyists that would lobby for us to get us on the radar scope of putting some line items and getting things. Not that we don't deserve it or we want something undeserved. I think the issues are so immense. The problem that I've seen and, you know, for atmospheric science community, ocean community, federal agencies that are involved with them are also concentrated. We are scattered throughout all the agencies, okay? And even bringing them together, thinking about a common hydrologic framework, modeling framework, is challenging and difficult, let alone get our own communities from different areas to push. I remember Kwasi in early days, most scientists among us who believe individual research will pay off better, and why should NSF put its money in one basket and try to do, even with SDCs and others? Well, leave us alone, let us write our proposals and get, give trouble to our friends at uh, NSF with more proposals, etc. cetera. Uh, with Quasi, that was the case, right? I mean, they, people objected to that. When you don't have everybody on, on the same page, it's difficult. I mean, I, w I wish that I live to see that in 10 years, we have maybe two or three national centers where our postdocs, everybody can go, go there and work over the summers, as they do with all of these things. I've sent students to NSSL in Oklahoma. And what a great pleasure to be there with tens of other people doing the same thing. How many opportunities we see outside of those for our people where we could send tens and twenties and thirties or forties to work together. Common hydrologic models and others require that kind of an environment. So we need to raise our profile scientifically. Everybody declares a decade, and here is my declaration of a decade. I think we should de declare a decade of testing and validation. Let's not do too many things if we cannot validate and see what it takes to improve things. Blindly trying to improve things frustrates us, and we engage in creating yet a new model because these are no good. We better do our something else. I think groundwater community has done that. How, how do you see hydrology? How do you see hydrology? Uh, looking at your presentation, it was models. Is there any your It was what? Models. 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 Only models. models. Yeah. Is there in your remark, you say, Hydrogeology is something different. 
is hydrogeology hydrology? Of how course do you is. see how do you see hydrology between other science disciplines like philosophy, sure. social science, linguistic? Well, they're all there, but I talk about my own bias. I come from a surface hydrology background. I cannot necessarily get into areas that I don't have necessarily the expertise. But even the crudest hydrologic model has all the components involved with it. We know subsurface hydrologic part is represented very poorly in surface models. I mean, we, we just don't go to climate models for a long time when hydrology was ignored, and let alone subsurface, etc. I think it is an integrated science, but at the same time, and I think, I'm sorry, my memory fails me. Somebody yesterday said this is great, but we still need to work on each aspect of it and improve. But then we need these environments where we can sit together and try to merge you know, progress in the various fields. Okay. Just take two more questions, John and Jessica. John. Thanks so much for the simulating talk. Um, let's talk about the future. Um, I'd like to know your perspective because you hinted at non-stationarity early on. Nick Metalis, for those who haven't seen it, has a journal of water resource planning and management short editorial on the Hearst phenomenon recently. recently. So it's a one, one and a half page. He hints about how we can use go back to the older stochastic hydrology questions to answer the newer questions um, of today and the future on is there going to be change. So the question to you is, if we're going to focus on validating and testing models, how can we go about using those older stochastic concepts to look at potentially time-varying parameters or non-stationary of model parameters? There are different approaches in my view, again, limited maybe. Uh, they each represent and, and, and maybe provide different answers, OK? Statistical methods are limited by the fact that you're only using the data, right? And it's very short within the life of uh, our planet Earth, right? OK. That's given, at least in statistical hydrology, you have established your assumptions. You know you cannot go outside of those assumptions, OK? And you know their limitations. That's why it's probabilistic. With more of the modern ways by which we do downscaling and others, and the mindset in the user community is, uh, who was it, uh, Pilkey was, uh, Roger was mentioning, that the guy, the mayor said, hey, I, heck, I want the weather service to give me one number, right? We still see a lot of that. With these kinds of models and downscale, they think these models are so sophisticated and good that I can actually give you a limited number of answers. So I think this is the, the problem that we're going to face. Each one will present different answers. And uh, I have to find and read Nick's uh, thing because I haven't seen anything out of him uh, for a long time. This is great to know that he's there. Um, and Suresh, you showed a lot of very discouraging graphs to, with flat line of encouragement. I, I, wondered, I apologize. That's OK. But could you, could you end with just some words of advice and encouragement for those of us who are still at the beginning of our careers of how do we make sure that you know, when we're close to retirement, our graphs look better than some of the ones you show? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, maybe we, can, we need to talk outside this. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's fantastic opportunities for the younger generation. Uh, I'm sorry that a lot of the younger scientists, new faculty joining universities, uh, perhaps will have a harder time than we did in our time because I don't know how much the size of the programs that you have to go for your funding have grown. and. The, the challenge is, of course, with our colleagues at NSF and other agencies, how they can grow the size of the pie uh, to allow. I mean, for me, it was disheartening to see how much excitement was created when the call for water sustainability, those categories come. And for the bigger ones, uh, there were 60 proposals, uh, uh, I think, or so, maybe three or four were. So a lot of people put so much effort to put these things together, and yet, they don't go anywhere. I think one other thing I learned from Sahara days, by the way, which is useful. After it was all done, 
one of the key program people say, hey, by the way, it's done deal and you guys got the center. But I'll tell you, boy, the, your community is some of the toughest people on yourselves. And, you know, my center was one with adaptive optics and neurobiology, etc. So those communities are so supportive of themselves. And boy, the reviews you guys got and the difficulties. I love to make the difficulty for our program managers by being kinder and nicer and don't pick on everything and turn everything down because let the problem be. <laughs> With my friends at NSF to try to, Tom and others, they're having 50 proposals with all excellence and very good. Give benefit of doubt to the younger people with their ideas. But you know, at the same time, you have to have good visions and good presentations of your ideas and not get bogged down in one more downscaling of this. Because unfortunately, once something starts as a trend, if you send it outside of that, forget it. At NASA and others, it doesn't get anywhere. Thank Sorry if it was answered to your question, but that's. Thank you, Sue, once again, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, let's let's take a 15-minute.